things that um, I've seen personally in my years of practice is a shift from just seeing dual income families to moving toward female breadwinners and how that's changing the dynamics of the family. Um, certainly when um, we're having the wife or mother in um, the breadwinner role, it's changing things such as the custody determination for children, parenting time schedule, and also who may be the recipient of maintenance formerly known as alimony or child support payments. Because if the father, husband is available to be with those children, it may be that we're switching the traditional role of who's receiving support. Another trend that we're seeing um, because parties may be getting married later in life, we're seeing property that has been accrued prior to the marriage coming into the marriage and in some cases it may be um, transmuted into marital property by changing the title um, or other various ways or we're seeing that the non-marital property has stayed non-marital. Um, unfortunately, determining what's marital and non-marital can sometimes be a long process and somewhat contentious. Um, so as you know, couples may be getting later, married later in life, we're seeing that coming up as an issue, classifying marital and non-marital property, absolutely. We're seeing the financial crisis and the housing market challenging us as divorce attorneys quite a bit. What we're seeing on the housing market end is as we're going through a divorce with couples, really working out if someone would like to keep property, typically the marital residence, how will we effectuate that? Um, is the party who wants to keep the property able to refinance? And what we're finding is commonly the answer is no. And five years ago that was not the case. And now we are setting up more creative planning in our final agreements and ultimately the courts are using the same creative solutions. We are setting up structures so that if the party fails to refinance, it triggers a sale of the property. And what's really important is when you trigger a sale of that property is making those um, specific protective measures in the agreement so that everyone knows what's expected as the sale continues. So we've found that that specificity and um, that type of a roadmap in our agreements and judgments has helped parties significantly and the benefit is we're able to divorce them even though the property may not have been dealt with. I believe couples are choosing this route because they are looking for an alternative way to move through a traditionally difficult and impersonal process. There is nothing more personal than your children or your livelihood. And unfortunately, when you are coming into a courtroom, you are one of 2,000 on a docket. And one of 2,000 on any given day does not allow a judge to spend a lot of time on your case. So collaborative divorce allows you the opportunity to spend time and be represented settling issues with your spouse so that you know the ins and outs of your children, your marriage, and your finances, and you can also work through the process in the hope of maintaining a relationship after the divorce is over. Um, it is important that the candidates um, are people that can already have communication and are responsive to their spouse in some way. My husband and I have been involved with the Hubbard Street Dance Company for the past couple of years. Uh, we've really enjoyed it. Obviously the performances are spectacular. Um, we admire the dancers greatly, but more importantly what we've really been interested in is the cultural awareness that Hubbard Street has brought to Chicago. I was recently on the committee for the Bold Moves for Bold Women event and they had two esteemed Israeli choreographers come to Chicago and um, perform with the dancers and it was spectacular and to have that cultural exposure here in Chicago and to have Hubbard Street bring that around the world is just something we are delighted to be connected to.